Um, this is the uh, second in a series that um, I have been calling How I Thrive or How We Thrive, um, where I interview people about um, what they've learned works well when it comes to thriving despite struggle. Um, and who better for us to be interviewing today than the wonderful Kate Lester, who um, many of you would have seen in her starring role in the film How to Thrive. Um, Kate, welcome. Hi, Marie. Good to see you and uh, good to see everybody as well. So thanks for coming along today. It's great to um, be here. Oh, so, so lovely. This is an interview that I've been very much looking forward to. I think when it comes to um, somebody who has embodied what it means to be a beacon, um, Kate is absolutely it. And those of you who have worked with me will know that Beacon is my favourite for thriving. Um, and Kate has been someone who has kind of grabbed that wholeheartedly um, and in a really determined way applied that uh, in ways that have really transformed her life and, and now are transforming others. Um, so um, I will just um, jump in, Kate, and I think, you know, we might just go backward a little bit before we come to how things are today, just to give our audience a little bit of an understanding of how we first met and how things were for you at that time. So if we think about when you first came to How to Thrive, you responded to um, uh, an ad or, you know, to come and audition for this film that we were doing where we were going to be taking a different approach to thinking about how we support people who are struggling to thrive. Um, can you tell us a little bit about how things were for you at that time um, and, uh, you know, what, what had been going on in, the, I guess, the year or so, or the years before before that time? Yeah, well, thanks, uh, Marie. Look, I was, um, I was really struggling at the time and when I came to meet you, I was probably in the worst um, part of my life. I'd really probably been struggling since I was about 14. Um, there was some early trauma and, you know, some eating disorders. So I had some anorexia first, which led on to bulimia. And um, and I struggled really with um, ongoing depression from that time um, until I met you. Um, it really was up and down and um, I was medicated sometimes, not medicated other times, but I struggled. I struggled to, um, you know, I put myself through uni and uh, did an MBA, but I struggled always to stay in the workplace to keep jobs for after a few years because, um, you know, just my mental health and, and everything was very difficult. Of course, I went on to have family, which was lovely, but with that came more complexity and having the disabled as disabled daughter as well just really added to that. And I think, you know, probably about, I think it was five years before I met you, uh, it was the first time that I really realised that I was having these um, really acute um, I, um, suicide ideation thoughts. And um, it was at the point that I thought, you know, I should probably go and see my um, GP and, you know, I was on some antidepressants then and she says you know I, I think it's time that you thought about seeing a psychiatrist and and from that point on um had quite a good psychiatrist but had a few admissions to hospital um and I had different treatments different medications but it was very much um clinical based and um once you're admitted to hospital it's all clinical you know, and, and you forget really how to look after yourself because you're looking at it from a biomedical model as opposed to a holistic model, I suppose. And um, so I was, um, so I really um, went through the next few years um, going in and out of hospital, um, having various jobs, looking after the kids at times, you, you know, of course, when I wasn't in hospital, but, you know, it was a very difficult time. So when I came to you, I just, um, I was at my wit's end, I suppose you could say. You know, it was like one of those things I saw um, a message on Facebook, and I remember somebody forwarded the, this message on Facebook that said they're looking for people who've been through hardship, you know, have had different um, um, depressive moments, I suppose. And I, I read it and I thought, you know, that's exactly me. I've been through such a hard time. 
I think I could teach other people, help other people, but at the same time, I've got to get myself out of this rut because I, I felt that the system wasn't really serving me right. Beautiful. So, and when you um when you came in our first um uh how to thrive you know um session was at a wilderness retreat right out in the countryside we didn't have any internet it was quite um remote a bit like a school camp really wasn't it and when you arrived at the camp that day Kate you had come straight from hospital hadn't you yeah so I, I'd just been in hospital a lot had um, ECT, which is electroconvulsive therapy. That would be the biggest mistake I've ever made in my um, in my life. I really had that because I was just so. I suppose I only saw one way forward, and it was either having a life or not having a life. I suppose, and I thought um, the way it was presented to me that maybe ECT would give me um, a good way forward. It didn't. It actually took away a lot of my memory and uh, it really um, made me quite confused and um, I had to really um, establish myself again in life because it just took away chunks of my life and people that I knew and uh, and occasions, I just couldn't remember them anymore. And I remember being on a, a Zoom call with all my friends and this was during COVID and these were friends that I'd met during my MBA. So I, I'd known them for about 20 years. And I knew their names, but I didn't know where they lived, what they did as an occupation and who their families were. And so that's how that's how bad it was. And so when we came to that um, retreat, I was just so confused. I didn't know what was going on. My daughter was in hospital that day. She was being operated on, if you remember, mm. Maisie had that um, rollerblade accident. And, um, and, I, and I was amongst all these new people and they were all pretty excited to be there and I was just um, in a, a really bad state of a depression the ECT didn't help but it, it took away everything that I had that I was. Yeah it was pretty full on I remember um, you know that you were quite confused and had difficulty remembering things and I remember the first few times we had you do the strength survey and you didn't remember you'd done it and then you did it again you did it again you were like oh my god which version is me and it was like really pretty um, intense wasn't it. And so, it's um, a hard thing to look back on as well you know that that was that was my life. Mm, that was you your know, life. And, and also remember the medical profession actually thought this was a good way for me to go down. And mm. so, you know, I'd never advise anybody to do that. And if they did to, you know, to really talk with other people that have done that and to really seek better advice because I thought I'd done that and I hadn't. Yeah, I mean, I guess, you know, ACT is a particular thing. And I think, of, you know, what it really indicates was the desperation. Yeah that you experienced at that time about trying to become well. Um, and yep. that's why you took that decision, I think. And um, I remember you telling me you were going to do that and saying, I've been advised and to do this and I think I'll go and do that so I can be as well as I can be when I come to participate in How to Thrive. Um, we obviously didn't realise that it would maybe set you back. Um, yeah. But anyway, so, such is life. So when you um, applied to be part of how to thrive um, and you um, came to learn that it was based in, in positive psychology. What were you hoping for um, at that time about participating in the program? Yeah, well, I was hoping that I'd, um, first of all, I'd um, learn something, I suppose, a stupid word, positive. I suppose with a, you know, within the medical model, quite often you're looking back a, you're being medicated for what's gone wrong in your life. You talk to a psychologist and you're talking about the past and and everything's about trying to deal with the past. And I was sort of at a point where I've had enough of the past. It's taken up a whole heap of my life and, you know, I've got to really move on from that and start to look forward. And how it was presented to me, the program, was that, you know, would be applying something that could really, um, really, I suppose, change your life in a, in a positive manner. And it also didn't um, need medication or, or different forms of treatment. You wouldn't be, you know, wouldn't need um, extra hospitalizations or anything. And um, I thought the model was extremely 
um, was a good model, I think, um, when I looked at it because it made sense to me. You know, it was a simple mm. model, I thought, that um, mm. that you'd want your best friend to go through. Oh, that's a beautiful thing to say. It's a beautiful thing to say, that you would want your best friend to go yeah, through no, that. Definitely, well, definitely, because, I've, you know, I've been in hospital and I wouldn't want my best friend or my family to go through that. So you've got to start mm. looking at what else is available. Mm. Mm, beautiful. And so then... Um, how would you be able to explain to um, people who are listening to us today, now that you do know more, um, what positive psychology is and how that's different, if you had to sort of put that in a sentence or two? Yeah, I suppose positive psychology is more about dipping into your life and finding out, focusing on what's good rather than what's bad. And really, by focusing in on what's good, you then feel better about things. And uh, there are different um, different things that we did throughout the program. And I remember the joy jar, you know, we put some nice things into a jar and we called it the joy jar. And, you know, if you felt a bit down, you'd pull, pull something out of the joy jar and it might be like go for a walk or have a coffee with a friend or you know, play a game with your kids and, you know, they, they always brought joy to you. But I think, you know, the, and again, the other model, the medical model is very different to that, where it says, don't forget to take your medications, you know, <laughs> do this, do that. So it's quite, as I said, very um, clinical based. Now, it should, you, everybody's got to know I've got complex depression, so I still do take medication. And I still do have to follow a regime. But I've been doing that for years and nothing changed. It wasn't until I incorporated positive psychology into my world that I really had that positive change in my life. So it just showed that that the, the um, traditional model alone doesn't always work, that you need something else together with that for somebody with, some, somebody is, with a serious depressive illness is what, you know, what I've got. Thank you, Kane. And I do think that's really important that we, um, a couple of things, that we, we're definitely not here to bash the medical model and the clinical model. Um, you know, there is absolutely a place for that. And as you say, you have um, continued to use that. You have a great psychiatrist and a GP yep. and a team. Um, yep. And, you know, you have continued to need that alongside, you know, the, the work that you've been doing in positive psychology and, and with how to thrive. Um, so, you know, this is something about an and, not, you know, um, uh, a saying that we should replace what's currently available. But I think, you know, what we have discovered is that currently most people who experience um, struggle or mental health issues they get funneled into a system that really only offers them that and nothing else. Um, yeah. And so, you know, certainly my mission and the mission of How to Thrive is how do we make it more universally available um, to people wherever they are in a mental health continuum? Because we'd like people to learn these things before, you know, they were in such deep struggle. Um, yes. And so, you know, at that at that end of the continuum, it's about education, not therapy, and or maybe that, you know, all, all the way along. How can we learn these things um, like we learn how to be physically healthy? And most of us know to, um, you know, to eat well, sleep well, move well. But we haven't been taught oftentimes um, in school and from our parents and in workplaces. We, we don't know the equivalent um, of eating broccoli and going to the gym. So tell us, Kate, um, how are you now? Like it's almost three years. It is um, almost three years. So I am, yeah. I am good now. Like I'm really good. I um, I'm in full time work, and um, so I've got two part time jobs, and that really keeps me busy. I'm working in the area of um, mental health and also alcohol and other drugs, which is great. And um, so that's something that I decided to take on post your program. Um, and that's been a really fulfilling career for me to step into. Um, other than that, I'm also studying. So I'm studying at Monash University, doing a, a mental health course. And I'm also um, still the mother of three very busy children. They're three, th three years older now. So 
I'm like this um, suburban um, taxi driver. And, uh, and of course, I've got Penelope. So we're just, you know, we're busy. We're busy always. And, and I can keep up with life now, which is great because um, back then, I couldn't have worked and done everything that I do now. So I can sort of um, juggle a busy life and, and stay on top of everything as well. So I feel good about it. I've got good uh, connections with friends, excellent connections with families, um, my family, sorry, um, Penelope's family. And and I would say overall, everything's good. I'm exercising and living in a great area. We moved house, so now in a really nice area. So I'm happy. Oh, amazing. So if you um, think back to when you first um, joined How to Thrive and we had you do the hope letter yeah. um, and um, remembering you were in that state of kind of confusion um, and, uh, you know, if you if you were to think back now, um, uh, knowing what you know now, um, where do you think that you would have put yourself on that hope ladder um, being a scale from zero to minus 10 and zero to plus 10? And where would you put yourself today, do you think? Yeah. Okay. Back then, I actually put myself down. I think it was a negative four or a negative five, but I was actually way below when they were negative 10. <laughs> I just, I was sort of comparing myself with other people. But um, looking at myself today, I'm, I'm definitely a 7.5 to 8. And I, and I just say I'm not a 10 because how can you maintain a, a 10 in this busy lifestyle and there's all these external, you know, influences taking place? But no, I'd say a 10. And I am. I'm very happy with how things are going. I'm very um, blessed to have the 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 jobs that I have that I've been able to change careers. I feel I'm having a really positive impact on other people's lives in the area of mental health and AOD. And um, and it, it's great. Our, our family is thriving. The kids are doing really well and, and they're, you know, they're just growing. And, and really, uh, I think by having done How to Thrive, we're better capable of providing a positive environment for our kids as well really focused on their well-being and that's um and i think that's the, the a really key part of it as well is that i don't want them to get dragged by dragged down by life so how do you think that um so you're now saying that you'd be sort of seven and a half or eight out, out, out of ten on the thriving ladder. Um, and I think it is important to point out that, you know, the aim isn't really to be ten and to stay at a ten. Like, that isn't realistic. Yeah. You know, it's sort of about knowing that there's um, always kind of, you know, room to move and that we are living in lives that are quite stressful, quite busy. And there, there are. So that sounds really sensible to me. And what an extraordinary extraordinary shift from something that you're basically saying you would be like a minus eight or so and then you're now like a plus eight like no, that I is minus just a complete... 10. I was definitely below a minus 10. <laughs> below a lunch minus 10. I was sort of yeah. you know going the um so I think uh, and it's fascinating isn't it because I often um you know obviously that's in the film where we see you put yourself at a minus three and I do have a moment to myself and think hmm, minus three hmm <laughs> No. Um, and so it's interesting on reflection because, you know, it is um, uh, interesting knowing what you know now. Um, and, you know, you have spoken about sort of living behind a mask a lot of the time and needing to pretend to others that you were better than you were. Do yeah. you, you know, how does that that um, sit for you now? Do you still feel that or have you moved beyond that? Or You know, what, what was what was it like having to pretend all the time? Yeah, I think I, I did pretend because remember I went through um, eating disorders when I was very young and that wasn't addressed at all. And um, having believed me, you, you you sort of learn to hide secrets. And then, of course, um, in feeling how I was, you don't want to tell people that, you don't want to hurt people um, by saying this is how I feel because, um, you know, at that point, I hadn't really spoken up and said, you know, I had um, periods of really deep depression and, and this suicide ideation that was going on. And and you, I was worried more about other people than myself. So, mm -hmm. um, you know, throughout the years, my parents knew that I was up and down, but they always thought that medication held me. 
um, which just wasn't the case. I think sometimes in some ways I would have been better off to do something a lot more conducive. But, you know, I'd, I'd find a, a therapist and, and sometimes they just didn't work, like you don't bond or something. Like I remember one time I said to a therapist, I said, you know, I, I just can't stand living with bulimia, you know, it's killing me. And um, I just wish I had anorexia again because when I had anorexia, I had so much power, like you just didn't eat. And she goes, well, if you think that way, you're absolutely crazy. And so, you know, <laughs> I, I had some really stop moments in my life where, you know, you you try, you put your hand up for help and it didn't always work. Mm -hmm. so, so then if we think about um, where you are now, which is just such an absolute turnaround um, from where you were, what are the things that you do now? to maintain a state of thriving because life has not changed. You're still a busy parent with three yeah. kids, one of whom has, you know, autism. Um, so life continues to be a complex and challenging place. So what are you doing um, that is keeping you in a more consistent state um, of thriving? Yeah, well, one thing is, um, well, I've included the beacon model in every part of my life. So, Every day, I make sure that I, um, I'm pretty much accountable, even though I, accountability is part of that, but I'm very much accountable to the Beacon model, model and ensuring that I maintain all the facets within that. Because I, I, I know myself, if I don't connect with other people, if I don't have a sense of belonging, if I don't nurture myself, then I'm going to lose who I am. So I'm very much committed to that model. But I've also um, gone back to work, having mm -hmm. meaningful workplaces, being mm -hmm. in a positions that I'm helping people um, and um, and really implementing changes also within the workplaces. So that's been really um, satisfying for me. And also studying, um, being back and learning again. You know, I think that continuous learning through life uh, for me is an incredible uh, positive thing and also just looking at life in a different way because through going through your program I did start to to you know I started to look at life like I remember at one stage I had that um, you know the vision I choose life right mm. and um, that might sound a bit corny to some people but that was from a place where I'd come from where from for years I'd thought about taking my life and I had tried to do it once. So all of a sudden I've stepped into life. So you're looking at it, well, how am I going to move forward? And so I always ensure I do a lot of positive things during the week, catch up with friends, I'm sure that we do fun things as a family. Um, and also throughout the process, make sure I exercise, do my mindfulness, you know, meditation, yoga and different activities as well, ensuring that, you know, I'm good. Because in the past, I always thought other people had to be good. I worried too much about them. But I also took accountability for me and look at, am I good? And am I being, am I in a place that I can also be the best parent possible for my kids, you know, and the best wife possible for my wife and the best you know, employee that I can be for my employer. So there, that's really how it's how it's changed too. And I, but I also um, expect things back. You know, I expect my employer to give me things back, and I expect the same from my kids. You know, so that it's more even now. I mm. think that's beautiful. Thank you, Kate. I think that's um such a great way of thinking about um having the framework. And I've heard that from lots of people. And actually, as he was saying that, I was I was actually been thinking how um I do that too. You know, the 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 running through beacon most days and um going okay, 
Um, I mean, I, I guess for me, I think about a, a beacon bank account, you know, and what yeah. deposits and withdrawals am I making? And, you know, some days I won't get up early and exercise, but I am but I think, but I'm going to be around for the kids and I'm going to connect with them more. So might have taken from that bucket and put into that bucket. And then I think yeah. I'm doing something that's really energizing for me. And so, you know, having that um, framework and that lens and having it sort of easy that you can run through it. Like I probably knew those things from since I, when I studied positive psychology. I knew like those kind of determinants of thriving, but having a framework and being able to think about it in that way, I probably helped myself as well, which is kind of funny. But um, they say we seek to learn what we most need to know. So there you go. Um, so, um, Kate, I, I, I'm interested, you know, for you talking about um, the work that you do now. And I think, you know, what you're describing there um, is a big part of the E of Beacon about engagement. Um, and finding a way to use your strengths in service of others, finding something meaningful to do, and both with your study and with your work, um, it sounds like you've really dialed up that um, that area of beacon that wasn't necessarily so um, evident, you know, previously. Um, so, how important has that been for you? And then, have you had the opportunity? to be able to take what you've learned and share it with others um, in the work that you now do? Yeah, look, at engagement, connectivity, it's just so important to me now. And look, it's and if you even look at people in um, the mental health system, so many of them enter there because they have lost connectivity with family and friends and they don't engage with um, services or community organisations or anything and and that sort of stuff is just so important and um, so for me um, I engage in life fully now and um, and it's sort of um, it sounds it sounds a bit like a buzzword but it's nice to be able to think that everything's possible but you can't do everything so what do you want to do and so we're at the moment planning this great overseas holiday. So we're going to Europe at the end of the year for four weeks. Oh, and we're really going to do it, trying to do it on the cheap and take the kids on, you know, you know, on the train system and just having some real fun. So getting them off their iPads and everything and just, you know, doing that good family fun stuff. But how I've applied it also in my, in my work is that, of course, I do deal with um, – we, we call them consumers, uh, as the um, people who are unwell, but also uh, families, carers and supporters um, of the people that are unwell. And I always focus on uh, the Beacon model with them and ensuring that they really understand why it's so important for them all to connect with life. Like by reconnecting with life, it's amazing how it can change your perspective. And we see that in... Um, even they, they've done many, many studies. Uh, there was this one, Rat Park, and if if I could even um, send it out to you, Marie, and you could forward the link. But it was they did a study about all these rats, and they were in this um, in a cage, and there was like one rat, and it had um, and it had heroin mixed in with its um, water, and then it had water as well, and so that the rat kept going to the heroin. And, um, and of course, it finally killed itself. And so what they thought, well, if we put many other rats in into Rat Park and we gave them really fun activities to do and all this sort of stuff, will the rats still go for the heroin in the water? Or will they go for the water? And it actually showed that the rats went to the water because they were connecting with each other and they were having fun. And it just shows, you know, I was just blown away by this. And it's a, a really, you know, it was a true study. But, you know, it just shows that by, you know, belonging, you know, engagement, accountability, connectivity, optimism and some nurturing, you can really turn your life around. And, um, and it's very powerful. Mm -hmm. And for me, it changed my world. And, and keeping in mind, I still have the clinical depression, but I can manage that. And um, I can stay on an equilibrium. And if I don't see my doctor and it's all, all right, but he is also blown away by how well I now are and um, how I've been able to change my life, have full-time employment, be a mother, do the study, you know, be a partner, 
go and do volunteer work, all the stuff that I'm involved in, get involved in the kids' activity, be on the parent, you know, communities and all that at the schools. So, yeah, it makes me feel good. And I think the Beacon models really um, saved my life. Okay, that's absolutely amazing. Thank you so much for sharing all of that with us. Um, and how do you think you thriving has impacted others around you, you know, perhaps particularly your children? Yeah, I think, you know, like I have an energy now. So they mm. like my energy, like to be a lot of fun. And uh, and we have a lot of fun and we play lots of games and we do stuff and get out and they see me, you know, doing a lot of exercise. And, you know, I'm a better role model for them now. Mm. I think I feel very bad about some things that occurred in the past. That was very difficult for me to really comprehend and I've had to work on that. Um, you know, like my, my kids knew that I wanted to take my life. They knew that I'd self-harmed. They knew that I'd overdosed. You know, uh, they knew I had eating disorders. So, you know, I don't look on back on that proudly, but I suppose what mm -hmm. I've shown them is that you can get o o over these things and have a, have a po positive life going forward. And also from that, because I have so many learnings, I can help them also and help other people. And they see me helping other people in the workplace. And they say sometimes I'm too nice with people, but I don't think that's the case. <laughs> but yeah, a lot, even at work, people have enjoyed me having me around. They, they say, you know, you bring so much energy and life into the workplace and you know I always think I, I really like having connections with people like when I walk in I always say hello to everybody and you know you find sometimes at work people just you know sort of just very much focused on their job and I just like connecting with other people and it's amazing just how that adds to your day and how it can influence somebody else's day as well. Beautiful. Those little micro moments of connection, huh? Yeah. And uh, I've uh, taken a beach walk with you before, and I can actually attest to that because everybody says hello when you say hello, and it's uh, yeah, it's a beautiful thing. But hey, I also, one of the things, oh, sorry. I have to say, I changed my clothing when I came into <laughs> member into the yeah. program, and I've started wearing. I got rid of all my black clothes, and now I wear colourful, colourful clothes. And it's incredible. I can be just in you know, a bar or in a shop or anywhere and somebody will come up and go, I really like the colours that you're wearing today. Yeah. And well, we can't see, Kate, you'll have to maybe show them that you've got zebras. Um, like Kate zebras. has zebras on her top today. It's purple with zebras on it. I just love that. And you, absolutely, it was almost like a visible transformation that happened, that you started to wear brighter colours and, yeah. you know, it does draw people towards you. I it think makes you, so. It sort of uh, makes you feel better. If I, yeah. put, I put on black the other day, I was like, took it off completely. Took it off. Yeah. Oh, my God. So there you go. There's an, there's an easy um, um, tip for everybody. Um, Kate, one of the things that people often struggle with, even if they know how to thrive, is holding themselves accountable for doing those healthy habits. Um, what advice do you give about that accountability piece? Because I certainly have observed with you that that is something that you've been very good at. So I wondered yeah. if you had any advice about what was that you found that motivated you and then also kind of helped you stick to the things that were working? Because it has been three years now and life hasn't gotten easier, but you've been able to hold those habits and, um, you know, things that are helping you. I be kind to yourself. So... Don't put it, don't be too stressful. And remember, it's part of any sort of recovery that you're going to have a setback. So don't expect yourself to be perfect. Um, and I think, too, is that um, I, I kept a journal. I don't always now because um, I don't find that actually it's necessary. Um, but at the beginning, I did, and I'd write down, you know, um, things that I wish to do. So at the beginning, I wrote down what I ate. Um, ensuring that I ate well and what sort of exercises I did. And I remember when we were in the um, How to Thrive program, I did over 100 days of running. You did. So I've actually started that program again now because that was really positive and it just makes me – makes um, and it's something that I like, actually. I like giving myself goals. But, yeah, um, yeah I just think 
really with that accountability is do something that it's achievable. So don't don't try and fly before you can walk and maybe write it down and have a mini plans within that. And if you fail at times, who cares? Nobody else yeah. knows. <laughs> yeah. And um, just put it down. I, and I shouldn't say the word fail. I should just say put it down as being a learning yeah. um, because maybe you're being a bit too hard on yourself and um, and start again the following day. But I really, I, I really say be kind to yourself. And there's those great T-shirts, you know, be kind. And uh, I love them because so often we're so hard on ourselves that we forget to be kind to ourselves and just to nurture ourselves. And you might say, I want to exercise every day, I want to eat better, and then you go out and that doesn't happen. But that's fine because it doesn't have to be every day. Yeah. You know, it's got to be the overall theme should be that you're the best person that you can be. Yeah, that's what I focus so on. So how important for you was, I was I was figuring, fiddling around here because I knew that I had your vision board somewhere. I pulled it out yesterday and it was underneath the pile there. But um, how important was it for you to have goals and to be able to see where you were going in order for you to hold yourself accountable for things today? Well, I gotta say, you helped me out with a lot of those because <laughs> we, I, everybody, I was probably the worst um, individual on the how to throw program that when we started, because I was just so confused and didn't know how to be good, and I'd only felt really bad about myself for so many years that even thinking about having a vision, I couldn't do, and the whole Beacon program was just, you know, just out of my grasp, but. Um, I remember we talked, we talked, we talked and started to set some goals. And then one day the vision just came, you know, and that was um, about, you know, um, I choose, what did I say? I choose, I choose life. I, I choose life. That's right. Um, and once I came up with I choose life, it was all very easy because then I could just go, well, this is what I've got to do. How do I want my life to think? And how do I want my life to be? And then we started coming up with ways of that. And I we started talking about working. And then I thought I'll do a course. And remember, I then did the um, training and assessment course. And I'm now using those skills within my job now. So part of my job is training. And also started talking about work. And it was you that came up with the idea that said that I should <laughs> work in the mental health arena because um, I have many skills on that. And I was very lucky then to, as again, I was part of, you know, being on Facebook, I heard about different groups and I joined them and that allowed me to get some expertise in the area and I was then able to get employment. And now, you know, I'm fully enmeshed within the area. So, and, you know, around family as well, um, different things that we do and it's been really quite powerful by just turning my my um, life around and always having a goal like a goal is to have a great holiday so where are we going to go we plan it with the kids and and then we make it happen mm. um mm. so beautiful so then Kate just um be, before we give everyone um a chance with with their questions just um Finally, if you um, were speaking to someone who was struggling, um, what would be your kind of key piece of advice? I guess what you, what I've heard you say is, you know, being kind to yourself, setting goals, choosing something small, not, not expecting too much of yourself, um, uh, you know, take a day at a time, but, you know, when you get to it, thinking about where you're going, um, is there is there one sort of thing that you would want to say to someone who was struggling like you were uh, back then? Yeah, definitely. And I, I actually worked with this family recently and they were really struggling. Um, and it was a very difficult meeting we had first up because they were very traumatised and, and everything. And I I said to him, you've got to start looking after yourself. You've got to put yourself forward. Remember that old adage where, you know, you fit your own face mask before you can fit 
you know, you put one on oh, somebody mask. else. Yeah. And, it, and it's really is about that. And I think that life should be about that, that if you're at your best, then you can give more to other people than if you put other people first. And it doesn't mean at any point are you putting anybody second to you. It just means that you're putting yourself first so that you can be your best to best meet other people's needs. And and with this family, they actually um, went from a position of being very traumatised. And, and I introduced the Beacon model and underneath nurturing, I really um, talked to them about doing some yoga and mindfulness and getting out on the bike and doing the different things. Well, in the end, they came back to me and they said, oh, Kate, we don't need you anymore. I think we're doing quite well. And you know, the person that they were um, caring for um, was also, you know, they felt that they were doing pretty good and I felt pretty let down. I was like, oh, but they actually then came back to me and they said, oh, we, we want to let you know you've changed our life. And they said, you started, you took us from a frame of, you know, we have to put somebody else forward first to looking after ourselves and by doing that that we're happier people and that we're able to give more now and that was you know that nearly um i nearly fell off my chair when i got that and that was a real um it was it was a beautiful message for me to receive that you know what i'd applied to my life and by giving that those messages to other people it really changed their world as well and i was very 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 um blessed and to receive that message oh, that is absolutely absolutely beautiful and how lucky they are to have you you know like um i've i've seen and heard a little bit about what you're doing and how you're doing it and you know what an absolute gift to have someone with your both lived experience of what that feels like and then now to be you know, I don't know if we we say that sort of in recovery. I'm not sure what words we're supposed to use because there is different sort of views about that. But to me, um, you are now the epitome of someone who thrives despite struggle. And I know yep. that you have continued to face some enormous life challenges, including losing your beloved mother after a horrible death. Um, and, yep. you know, you've navigated some really tricky life events over those three years. Um, and it's not like you haven't felt those things very deeply and had some dips. And but you know, I think that you know what you're describing and what I observe as well is the the um, example you provide about applying things really consistently and with accountability to thrive despite all of those things still happening. Yeah. So I just I think that's an inspiration um, and I'm sure that that other people will too. So let's um, have a look and see um, whether other people have some questions for you. Um, and by the way, everyone, I'm very um, uh, welcome uh, very comfortable with you um, asking questions verbally as well. Um, I see um, um, we've got comments about your shirt um, <laughs> and that it's amazing that you're having a ripple effect to people around you um, and lots of uh, encouraging comments. Does anyone have any questions for Kate? There's some questions in the chat, Mary. Oh, sorry. Uh, maybe I, I haven't. I've scanned <laughs> that I, I, I couldn't see questions. I can only see comments. One from Kim. I'm happy to. Sorry, I can't turn my camera on for some reason, but um, I'm studying positive psychology at the moment, Kate, and I'm just so interested. I actually asked this on the um, the virtual screening the other night too to get Marie's um, perspective. But just wondering, um, what um, I guess, how much of the experience you had of you know um, going on the journey with others. Do you think contributed to you know the positive gains that you all made? Because I guess from 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 viewing the the documentary, it really seemed to normalise the struggle, and I was just taken with just again the progress everybody made, but just how quickly things seemed to turn for you all. Yeah, I think um, that was very powerful, and I think we were in an, an environment where you didn't have to hide anything, and where you can just speak about your struggles as being a normal way of life 
And by doing that, we gained a lot of confidence. And once you start talking about something um, and you've verbalised it, you understand it more, other people hear it, you feel, well, you feel heard and then you feel like, I want to do something about this. And also the group thinking was, hey, we want to take this on and let's, and, and there was sort of, I don't, I don't know if you'd say competition, but you saw other people doing well. And then you also wanted to, you're like, how are they doing that? So you'd sh share what's sort of like working for them. And I know that um, some others had their vision boards done before I did. And I was like, oh, I'm not yet there. And, you know, I remember Marie showed me one of them and it really helped to kick me along and to um, really started me thinking about what I wanted out of life. And, and it wasn't just then thinking about it, but you had to implement it as well straight away. And then a lot of those sharings we, um, you know, did together, and which was great. And we caught up very often, didn't we? We back then we caught up every week, and we'd talk about how things were going and what people were doing. And even now we catch up, and we've been out for drinks recently. And yeah, it's great to see people really moving forward and doing positive things. Mm, yes, no, that's. Um, I think that's right. That that um, how you're describing it is. Um, uh, an element of holding each other accountable and being encouraged and motivated by seeing others' progress. Um, and, and there were many people, Kate, who were very motivated by you. You know, people would go, well, if Kate can do it, I can do it. You know, look at what she's um, um, up against. And so I think definitely there was that component of um, encouragement, support, celebrating, commiserating, um, bouncing off each other um, and, and a safe, safe place to... Yeah. Um, share your vulnerability and to practice some of the things that you were learning. Yeah, I, I felt, absolutely. I felt incredibly vulnerable because I became so sick I couldn't work. So all of a sudden, you know, I had a marketing background and all of a sudden I'm in this group of people that are fully functioning and working. Well, I thought that they were fully functioning, but they're able to work. And, and so I had to work on that as well. That was something that really challenged me that I had to say, well, I'm worthy enough to be here um, and, and I've got to work on this to, to know that I've got a lot to give. Um, and and, and through, um, through the process and through that group thinking and group activities, I was able to get to that point to work. Whereas I think if I had have done it on my own, I wouldn't be working like I am now. Mm. Well, and yeah, look at you now, now um, helping other people in yep. such an extraordinary way. So just amazing. Um, does anyone have any? Uh, oh, I, end up yes, there? they have. Sorry, it's a little bit harder to see with the um, the. Uh, the sorry, the I think that's me, um, Kate. Yeah. It's Claire. Um, uh, lovely to hear from you, and it's lovely to having seen the film to sort of see. Um, what sort of happened after the filming and after the program, I guess, officially ended. So it's really lovely to, to see that you're doing so well. Um, one thing that struck me in the film that I thought was just lovely, I think it was your youngest daughter when she read out the poem, which probably brought everyone to tears because it was just so beautiful. And I thought, God, what a, an amazing, for such a young girl, she was very empathetic and, you know, uh, obviously amazing emotional intelligence. And you just sort of said, you know, and we all as parents have regrets about perhaps our behaviour or could have done things better or things that we've let our children see that we perhaps think they shouldn't have seen. But I'm wondering if your reflection now is also as parents, we often try and hide things from our children and, and sort of present this almost fairy tale, unrealistic world. And you've demonstrated the lived experience and reality of what it's like to be human and struggle and do you think that actually your children have probably really benefited from that in some way, that they've had to develop skills and, and then had those experiences and work through that together? And, OK, maybe we, we wouldn't have wished all of it for our kids, but 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 the realism of that has to be of a benefit to them, do you think? Yeah, I really do now, um, because that's reality. We don't try and hide anything from our kids. So. You can imagine the table conversation at dinner when they're talking about tell us all about sex and everything and when they talk yeah. about mental health as like it's, you know, just Vegemite on toast. But they're very aware and they became mm -hmm. aware because we couldn't hide it from them. We're just not that those sorts of people. But 
I think kids are better off by knowing, like you imagine, like they've got social media, they've got the internet, you can put all the locks on everything and they will still get in. Mm -hmm. And I think by actually educating you, the kids in this area, they're better, better able to um, understand it, understand what's going on with you, be empathetic, towards other people and also kids these days they're wise like they mm. come across things early they get education at school earlier about mental health they have wellness programs at school as well and and I would like to think that whilst I've been through these struggles it's had a positive an overall positive effect on my kids for them to understand that anybody can get sick and mm. and uh, you're blessed if you don't, I suppose, but anybody can get sick and we've got to care for each other. And, you know, we've, you know, we lost my mother and, you know, I've had some mental, you know, mental health challenges and there are different things that have been going on. But I think I, we actually took my kids to the, uh, to a psychologist after we had, after I was in hospital one time, because I'd been in about four or five times. And so I, I we, took them all to the psychologist and my daughter said to me after two sessions do not do that to us again because <laughs> she said we get what's happened you've talked to us about it we're okay and yeah. so we talk at it, about it at times thing still and they uh, we have jokes about it as well and they used to call it, when I used to go into hospital they used to call it the royal grown-ups hospital <laughs> As oh, uh, World Children's Hospital, which we seem to have, you know, six monthly visits to with them. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, that's great. I think that it's the um, the extraordinary gift that you have given your children is that kind of raw honesty about um, life's most difficult moments, but also yeah. the gift of showing them that we can do hard stuff and we can come through it. You know, yeah. so you have absolutely um, given them permission to feel all of life's feelings and to say that, you know, share with you that they're not okay. But also the 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 seeing how hard you've worked and, and the example that you've given around we can also come up and we can learn things to do and and um and be better and I think that's just an extraordinary um role modeling but you know um, I also learned a lot from my kids like my eldest daughter's got you know quite severe autism mm. and you should say you know you would, for those that have seen the the film my sister uh, my daughter had um, had an eating disorder and we had to lock up food and and she was all always able to get it out and find stuff and she doesn't do that anymore and she's actually working in the area now um she's just done a hospitality course and has taken some time off school to do that and she's got she finds a way all around melbourne in trams and she gets herself to uh the pride center over in st kilda they have a cafe there that she's working at and she's we've come up with a brand and she wants to start selling food products and um you know it, I, I think just by life um, and by just having an open life with your family, I think good things come. You looked for her strengths and followed them as well, totally. I think, Kate. Hey? Totally. Yeah. Yep. Beautiful. Any um, final questions from our audience? We have just a couple of minutes left. There's one more from Kim in the chat. Mm -hmm. Um, oh, yes. OK, so in the absence of being able to replicate the experience, what's the best way you both see to continue the ripple of this incredible medium you've created? Um, well, as we can see, you know, we've got Kate out there, um, or, or the, the beacon of life, uh, quite organically beginning to use this um, with consumers. Um, look, I think that... Um, a couple of things for me, you know, we have created How to Thrive in a program um, and we are kind of sharing that out into the world. And my hope is that we have many, many Thrive guides around um, the country and around the world. Um, this is not my magic. You know, I've had the beautiful opportunity of being, you know, the medium and the teacher of, of Kate. But um, this is a whole area of science and work that um, we want 
to make universally available. And my mission um, really is how can we do that and and how can I take what I've learned and the way that I've packaged it that, that in a way that's sort of se sequenced and memorable and, and, and focused on accountability and transformation and how can we give that to other people to give it to other people so that um, over time it is available to everybody um, who needs it. So, um, but Kate, you might have some thoughts on that. And I know, you know, you and I are over dual conversation um, about exactly this, aren't we? And look, I know the film's incredibly, you know, the documentary is incredibly powerful. And so I'd say the majority of my friends um, came to that. And one of my work colleagues came to it is who is here today, the lovely Timothy. But um, people... My friends um, who saw that film, it's really changed their way of thinking. And it's, it wasn't about me, but it was about really mental health and well-being and positive psychology and how people's lives can be changed and through through this process. And I think by continuing to show the documentary, um, and continuing to promote the Beacon model and also for people that, you know, have have some knowledge of it. You know, if you see people that struggle and keeping in mind tomorrow is Are You OK Day, mm -hmm. it's a really good time for you to even reach out to your, your friends and family tomorrow and just ask them, are they OK? And if anybody's struggling, maybe you just share parts of this model and, and just talk to them, you know, how are you going? You know, are you connecting with people? You know, do you feel connected? And are you looking after yourself? And please put yourself first. You know, just simple little, you know, just little statements or just a, a really nice conversation over a cup of tea and it can really help to transform somebody's life. I'm just putting it in the chat box um, for people to go to um, howtothrivefilm.com because the um, the free app is also a good place to start and that's something that um, any of you can share with anyone um, and it will allow people to get their beacon score and then make some recommendations and offer some little, um, you know, micro interventions that people can do um, and that's certainly a starting point. And that was our kind of, you know, minimal offering that we wanted to make available to everyone so that there was no one that saw the film that was left with nothing. I think just to Kim's point as well that, um, you know, uh, what Kate's describing and the experience of people that were involved in the film was a very high level of intervention. Um, it's important to know that we've been able to replicate this again many times now with just the e-learning in one hour once a week for six or seven weeks. Um, and that's been really important for me that we've been able to kind of prove that and that the effect can hold over time. So, um, I think to Kim's point as well, we don't need to replicate um, that people had such deep access and involvement over a long period of time. We got a bit scuffled by by COVID, you know, yep. we had planned for the, pro the program to be over in three months, but things changed because of um, the 2020 experience. Um, and I think too, a lot of people, you know, the individuals within the program, a lot of them were really struggling to, mm -hmm. you know, was pretty intense, wasn't it? So, um, well, that is um, us come to um, uh, to to um, our time being up. Um, but Kate, I want to thank you so much for um, your bravery in becoming um, part of the film in the first place, and how the work that you have continued to do on yourself, and now rippling out into the world, and the difference that you're making for others. And to thank you so much for joining me today for this conversation and sharing how you thrive. Um, and I am absolutely certain um, that the people here with us today and others who might watch this recording will take away many um, tips from you and from your wisdom. Um, so I can't thank you enough. You're absolutely amazing. Thank you for uh, all that you are. And um, I want to thank uh, you, Marie, and for everybody coming today. Um, I can't tell you how much it is. It's so nice to just... Um, really connect with everybody here and to see people, you know, coming together in a space where we can openly talk about people's struggles and for it not to be foreign, but actually to get really engaged with it. And I I really um, encourage you all to get out there and to talk to other peoples and really to lean into life and to support one another and always be kind to yourself 
and um, and look after yourselves because um, at the end of the day, that's what it's about. And if you're good, then other people will be good too. So thank you so much. Amazing. Thank you so much, Kate. Thank, thank you. you, everybody. Thank you. It's been thank amazing you. to see you. All right. Thank you. Take care, everybody. Bye-bye. Thank you.